right, Mary, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to hear all of the insight that you have on this kind of spirited temperament. To kind of get us going, can you just tell us a little bit about your work and on this spirited or feisty temperament trait? So I have always wanted to work with children. Um, I'm one of those people that when I was 13, I read a book called Dibs in Search of Self, um, which was about a child psychologist actually. And I was like, that is what I'm going to do. And I started in early childhood education, but quickly recognized I wanted to work with their parents. And fortunately I was living in Minnesota that, and Minnesota had just started a statewide early childhood family education program through the public schools. And so I started teaching and then I had my first child <laughs> and many of the strategies we were teaching didn't work at home. It was very humbling. <laughs> I considered changing my career, but then I began to recognize there were other children like my son who were typical kids, but they were more. There was, there's more intensity and passion and um, persistence and sensitivity about them. And I began to recognize and research what made them that way um, and what did they need? Because many strategies people recommended, like ignoring them, let them cry it out, absolutely do not work with these children. Um, and so I just became passionate about it and started a curriculum for a class and then speaking. And then people asked me to share this information with their family members in another state. And then someone said, don't you want to write a book? <laughs> and it all just grew from there. Wow. Okay. So you absolutely have like the professional and the personal experience when it comes to spirited kids, <laughs> it sounds like. Yeah, I do. And I think that's really important because there's a lot of information and even titles that people use to describe spirited children that are not positive. And that was, I coined the term spirited because I, I one, my husband is spirited and I love this guy. <laughs> and I could see in him how these traits of intensity and persistence and sensitivity are traits we value in adulthood. Um, but the kids need a little help developing the skills. And so I, I was adamant. I'm, I'm, you know, an absolute warrior in protecting parents of spirited kids that your children, your spirited children arrive spirited. And people will say, in utero, this baby was rolling around so much we called him bear. Or, you know, the nurses in the nursery said, you got to keep them in your room. This one's waking all every other baby up. Um, and, you know, they, they arrive wired like a race car. Um, and it takes more skill to be the parent of this child who is sensitive and, and perceptive. Oh, absolutely. And yes, I, I have two children at home and one of my kids, I would say, um, is spunky. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've listened to your book and so I'm not full, I'm not sure all the way on that full end of spirited, but yes, some of those traits that just require more from us as parents, you know, to navigate and to help them teach those skills. Um, and so actually one of the questions I have for you is, you know, you mentioned the coining this term spirited. Uh, sometimes we hear the term feisty or uh, maybe a not so positive word difficult. Um, and so is there a difference between these things or just spirited is just kind of a more positive term for it? Well, I, it, it, spirited is a very intentional term. Because what spirited does is immediately draw you to their strengths. And how we perceive someone changes our response. If, if we see someone as difficult and obstinate and, um, you know, hyper, it's like, I don't want to spend time with this person. And the fact is, our arousal system goes up we activate <laughs> um, and these children are so sensitive that 
they will perceive that and they synchronize to the stress level of the adults around them. And so by focusing on spirit, that they're, they are tenacious, they are um, you know, committed to their goals, these are traits that predict success when well guided. And so it changes our relationship with this child when we can see that potential. Oh, absolutely. And to be able to value our, one of our, our writer on our podcast, Barb Ben Swanson keeps reminding us of temperamental gifts. We have temperamental gifts. Yes. Um, and, and I do, I think that term spirited helps us see some of these traits that do require more, but they are gifts for our kids and especially traits we want to see into adulthood. We just have to survive and navigate <laughs> through childhood to get into adulthood, right? <laughs> well, I think the key is, and one of the things I do stress is being spirited is never an excuse for poor behavior. What it means is understanding this is a high energy child. And so we have to channel that energy in positive ways, but we don't have this child jumping on someone's couch and saying, oh, he can't help it. He's spirited. It's like, no, that is <laughs> that's not, not how this works. <laughs> that's not how it works. This is a tool for understanding. Yes, he's energetic. So let's make frequent stops when we're traveling. Let's plan every day to get him outside for large muscle play. Let's help him be successful and focus and channel that energy. But it's not an excuse to say, oh, he's wild because he's spirited. Yes. And we talk about that balance of, you know, understanding and accommodating our child's temperament and holding appropriate expectations for them. Uh, you know, that like, yes, it is, you're not allowed to jump on their couch or even though you're high energy or the expectation is that you're allowed to feel frustrated, you're not allowed to punch your sibling. <laughs> um, you know, we still right. hold those expectations um, and we understand, you know, we work to understand and accommodate that temperament. And um, to teach the skills, you know, so yes. one of the things that marks spirited children is their intense arousal system. Um, they are much more easily triggered. Once they are triggered, they stay elevated longer. Um, and as a result of that, they have to be more skilled, which initially means as the parent, you have to give them more support. So as babies, they need more holding, they need massage, they need breaks from stimulation, they need total darkness to sleep. Um, you know, so we have to be protective and we break skills down into teeny tiny steps to begin to help them learn um, how to get the brakes on. Um, mm. We build their emotion vocabularies. They have to be able to say, I'm getting frustrated. You, you can't manage an emotion that you can't name. And so as a parent, we have to stop and think. What is he feeling and needing? And anger is the second emotion. Um, so we, we can't just say, oh, he's mad. We have to get behind that. Is he afraid? Is he anxious? Is he disappointed? Did something happen that was unfair? Those are the words we have to get to and give to him so he can say, that's not fair, instead of kicking his brother. Yes, yes, to have the words, right? That's what we want them to ultimately get to. And it's what we expect once we get to adulthood, right? We don't expect yeah. to be kicked by another adult. <laughs> and so we're teaching them that skill we want them to have long-term. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. And you started to mention a couple of some of the temperament traits. We have spent an episode on each of the nine temperament traits from Thomas and Chess. Um, so a few that I heard you mention were that higher sensitivity, um, that, you know, perceptiveness or distractibility, some high intensity. And, you know, as I'm listening, I'm realizing many of these traits are ones I've already fessed up to having. <laughs> Any others that particularly come to mind for this spirited? Um, they tend to be slow to adapt. Um, many also have um, uh, 
an irregular temperament. And so they really need their environment to help them set their body clock. Because that's the other thing that spirited children must have is adequate sleep and regular meals and exercise and predictability in their day. That's foundational to helping them um, manage and regulate that fine tuned arousal system. Oh, and I, we have some, yeah, spunky and spirited kids in our family, you know, nieces and nephews and some, you know, my own kids. And, and I do, I think about even, you know, when we're together at family holidays and things get all out of whack. And then by the end of a, a family holiday, we're like all exhausted from our children who are having a hard time, yes. but because it's been very irregular. Right. Um, yes. And so thinking about that sleep and, and I think even just recognizing that it, maybe takes a more conscious effort to help them sleep or it takes more effort, you know, to set up those regular meal times that I think it's okay to honor that for parents. Like, would you say that that is something parents struggle with? Absolutely. Um, we know that parents of spirited children have to be more skilled and they are working harder. And that's one of the things when I, I, whenever I'm doing consults with families is I'll talk about that, Taking care of you is taking care of your child. And I have a new book, Raising Your Spirited Baby, coming out. And 50% of that book is taking care of mom, moms and dads um, and helping them to get the sleep they need, helping them to remain calm so they can pick up the cues and respond quickly and sensitively. Um, creating moments of predictability in the day <laughs> for mom and dad, <laughs> not, um, you know, it, it, with a very irregular, unpredictable baby, it feels out of control. Um, and so that self-care, and that's, that's, I really, again, in my interactions with parents, talk about, let's take care of you, because if you can stay calm, if you can pick up the cues, if you're able to to stick pretty, I, I call them because I'm living in Montana. I say, I want you to be a mama or papa grizzly <laughs> when it comes to this routine. Um, and and so we have to take care of you. Mm, I remember all too well with my child that, yes, I would say is closer to spirited maternity leave with that very little, very irregular, very sensitive, very perceptive baby. That was hard. And I, I can, I'll be honest. I did not, I threw myself into, that's what I thought I was supposed to do. Throw all of myself into this and, you know, leave nothing behind, you know, leave nothing for anybody else. And, and it was not good for me. <laughs> um, and so I can appreciate I've very much lived how hard that is. And I mean, I love my daughter, right? I love that she's spirited and spunky and all of these traits are so fun for me. Um, and I know will be great traits in adulthood, but that doesn't mean it wasn't really hard then. Um, and so I'm excited that we get to talk with you so that hopefully other parents can feel more prepared to navigate when it's tough and to have strategies for these kids that are just more. <laughs> right. And I think, you know, what you're also talking about there is building your support system. Um, raising a spirited child is not something you want to do on your own. But the challenge is because their intensity is significant, like you worry, well, if I leave him with somebody else, will he freak him out? Or um, one, again, we need somebody who will honor his routine um, and not say, oh, he's not tired. Look at him. He's running all around. <laughs> um, and, and so we have to work harder to build that support system. And, and we also need those people who say, look at his coordination. Oh my gosh, he's so curious. Look at him on that dining room table <laughs> or, you know, in taking apart something and can see again, um, the beauty of this person and, and the wonderful aspects of him or her and, um, and not only understand, but I think appreciate and realize 
lives are richer because this person has come to live with you. Oh, Yes. And I, oh, I, all of the things you said, I am thinking of people and children in my life that I'm like, oh, the stories we could tell. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, and I even think of legitimately having conversations with friends and family, you know, where they express a concern about I, like, well, we can't just hire the neighbor kid down the street. Like, I don't think they can handle them. Um, you know, and so like you do having specific people in your support system who understand and value, yes, that like that value, not just tolerate, right? We want people who right. love this kid like we do um, and see those beautiful things because there are so many wonderful traits about this particular temperament style. Um, you know, you mentioned that curiosity. I think of one of my favorite things is just the sense of humor. Like yes. I think spirited kids are just so funny <laughs> and sometimes mm -hmm. getting myself into trouble because I'm laughing maybe when I don't want to be or shouldn't be. <laughs> um, but there's so many great things about them. And the creativity. Um, and it, it, I, I love, um, I've been working with spirited children and their families for decades now. And people will send me updates or photos. And I recently got a photo of a young woman riding a camel. This was pre COVID. Um, and it, and the mom said, this is my spirited young adult adventurer. And she was riding camels somewhere in the world. Wow. <laughs> and I oh, think wow. you know, she had graduated with honors and double majors. And, you know, we do know from the research that given what they need, these children do excel. Um, and they're, they're pretty amazing people. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean... That's something to cling to as a parent, you know, that long-term mindset of, yeah, who will you become and the ways that you'll excel. That's a great thing. Um, but in the meantime, can I ask you about some of your suggestions for parents <laughs> when they're in the, in the thick of it, maybe sometimes having a hard time, you know, meeting the demands of a child who is more with this spirit? It well, again, I'm, I, I like to focus on kind of two elements in working with the spirit of kids. Um, structure is one, and structure are the things that stay the same. So they're your daily routine, they're your rules and expectations. And when, again, when parents come to me for consultations, I often, actually, the majority of time, um, the first thing we do is create a daily routine that protects their sleep, um, that reduces and eliminates surprises and unnecessary transitions. So we set it up that they wake up, they get dressed, they toilet, brush teeth, hair, toilet, you know, all of those things before leaving the sleeping area. Because every time you stop, start, every time you go upstairs, downstairs, in a room, out of a room, ask them to stop playing or turn off um, electronics. It's a transition. Transitions require regulation to come to the right level of arousal for them. And they open you to power struggles with spirited kids. So the first thing I'm going to do is, and, and quite honestly, 99% of my kids who are experiencing behavior issues, they're short on sleep. So that's the first thing we fix because then the frequency, the intensity, and the duration of the meltdowns diminish drastically. So now we have the time, we have the energy, we have the patience to do the emotion coaching. And that's, you know, working with them, teaching them the, the words to use, the actions to take, um, really important to teach these kids problem solving skills that, you know, I will listen with you, but I also need you to listen with me. Um, and so together we'll come up with a solution we're both happy with. The neat thing about that, and I write about that in, in Raising Your Spirited Child, is children as young as four will can be heard saying, when two children want the same toy, there's many things we could do. 
And they solve it. But the best part of that is if you teach those problem solving skills when they're young, these kids can be delightful teenagers because they've already learned to manage intensity. They've already learned how to be a problem solver. They're, they're perceptive enough to keep themselves typically out of trouble. <laughs> um, and because you've had to form that relationship with you, they're comfortable coming to you as a resource. Mm, I love all that. And I'm thinking to myself of, you know, like I said, all the stories we could tell you're talking about structure. One thing we do with our, you know, preschool age child, um, we call them done cards. And they're just kind of the routine that no matter who is putting you to bed um, in our house, is it mom, dad, or if like a grandparent is here, um, that the routine looks the same. And then when you've, you know, when you've gone to the bathroom, you close the card and it's done. When you've uh, brushed your teeth, you close the card and it's done. And I'm like, okay, whew, all right, we're doing okay with that. <laughs> and then there's downstairs cards, you know, for in the morning. She, you know, she's got to like get dressed, you know, go to the bathroom, brush teeth. And then once we get downstairs, you get your shoes, you get your backpack, and then you get breakfast. And figuring those kinds of things out to, yeah, to help provide that structure and consistency. We have found it, it helps eliminate a lot of the meltdowns and struggles. She knows what to expect with us, um, you know, no matter who it is doing that particular routine that day. Well, and the two other things you've done with that, Mackenzie, is along with your words, you've provided visuals. And because spirited children are so perceptive, Sometimes they have difficulty processing directions if they're only verbal. So when you use visuals like your cards or I'll do visual plans that we lay out like a cartoon frame um, or it, it, that you add that visual component to the verbal direction and now your spirited child can hear you. Um, and the other piece that you've done, as you said, is when you have that predictable routine, is anyone can do it with your child. So now you get a break because grandma can do it. The sitter or the nanny can do it. Dad can do it. Anyone that is a caregiver for the child can do it. And again, it remains consistent because you have it established and you have the pictures that show everyone what to do. Oh, yes. And it is. It's a nice thing. Um, my daughter, like I said, a little more spirited, you know, that low adaptability trait of this isn't how we do it, <laughs> you know. And so if you try to do stuff out of order or what she considers out of order, this that's not how you do it. Um, and so it is like, OK, as simple, simple as we can get it. And I mean, I do want to provide that consistency and routine for our daughter. But I got to be honest, it's also a little selfish of like. I need some things that make my life a little easier sometimes. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and so I think that's a win for both of us, which is absolutely feels good. Because to start the day fighting, um, you know, and if you don't have the routine, then sometimes your child gets up and gets dressed. Sometimes they don't. So then they start to play. Then all of a sudden you're saying to them out of the blue, it's time to stop and get dressed. Well, now you just surprise them which will trigger a slow to adapt child. If your child is persistent and committed to her goals, she wants to finish what she's doing and you're asking her to stop before she's finished. She's not going to be happy about this. Whereas if you get up, get dressed, take care of all of those things, have your breakfast and only play after the tasks are completed, now, you can play for a while and we'll use a color timer. Again, another visual tool <laughs> um, to help you know when it's finished. We will transition you. We'll say you've got 10 more minutes. What else did you need to do? Go do it. Um, you've got five. Where do you want to save that? What do you want to take with you? Now it's time to go. We've been fair and we can expect them to work with us. Oh, and yes, getting on the same team and, you know, I think of we talk about the term cooperation, um, you know, versus compliance. And so getting on the same team and it's not that necessarily that our child wants to be difficult. They might have 
intense feelings, big, you know, goals that are important to them with their persistence and those things. Uh, but we really are on the same team. <laughs> yes. Yes. And then the other piece of that is we also set clear limits with spirited kids. And the challenge with that is if you as a parent are not as persistent or you're highly sensitive and you know, when they shriek and it and it is louder and more piercing um, that, you know, you want to you, you you don't like it. You want to avoid it. And so sometimes we don't follow through because we don't we, we don't want the fit. But the fact is, is our spirited children need to know what that what we do, that we will do what we said we would do. Um, so, for example, you know, it's time to go. You can walk to the car or I will carry you. I'm going to count to three. If you have haven't decided to walk, then I will carry you. And you count <laughs> one. You can choose two. You can choose three. You didn't choose. So what you did choose is that I will carry you. Um, and this is when the child throws a fit and says, I'll do it. And a parent must say, sorry, you made a choice and then pick them up and carry them so that the child learns you will do what you said you will do. And those limits are clear and they can trust how you will respond, which actually is calming to them because they can predict it. Mm. Providing that, yes, that sense of predictability, which again, Low adaptability comes out to play. They know what to expect, makes it easier, you know, makes actually makes their world easier and more consistent. Yes. Oh, that makes so much sense. So I do have a couple specific questions that I feel like come up when we think of this child who's maybe, yeah, like we said, more <laughs> um, spirited and wonderful in so many ways. Uh, but sometimes some of the, I like to call them the parenting conundrums. Uh, so with a spirited child, I, you know, I think a lot of times we wonder, especially if our child, like you said, irregular, you kind of covered a little of this, but is flexibility important with a spirited child? Because, you know, you think of accommodating their temperament or, you know, rigidity in terms of getting them what they need. So how, how do you help us as parents kind of define, does our kid need more rigidity or do they need, you know, like that things are firm or do they need more flexibility? They need both. <laughs> um, okay okay so what they and and i will say instead of rigidity they need consistency and predictability okay and okay. but they also need and often for spirited kids we actually have to teach flexible thinking so like you said for your daughter it's like okay it's out of order this is not <gasps> right um but perhaps we don't have what we need today to follow the typical order. And so that's where the problem solving skills come in to be able to say to that child, ah, we've got a problem. You know, usually we have uh, yogurt smoothies for breakfast, but yes. <laughs> we're out of yogurt. Um, you know, so we need to think of three things we could do to have a good breakfast today and would would make both of us happy and your child says go get yogurt <laughs> yes <laughs> and you say that's one idea but we need two more and she locks in i want yogurt there's nothing else and that's when we have to say to her is that rigid thinking we have to be flexible thinkers we need two more if you need to take a break for a couple minutes, we'll take a break and then we'll come back because we need to um, we, we need to be flexible thinkers. And so we you know, we work with them and sometimes we have to set a limit with that to say, you know, I'm going to give you a break. If you can't think of any other things, then I'm choosing scrambled eggs today. Um, and they come back and they're not ready. And it's like, okay, then today we will have scrambled eggs and they may not be happy about it and, and they may not even eat. But we also know that within a couple hours, we'll be giving them a mid morning snack because um, they need it. And soon they will learn that if I want to be part of that decision, 
I need to work with mom and dad. And, and that's such a critical life skill to be able to listen and work together to come up with decisions that make everyone happy. Oh, yes. We, you know, you look for that in friends, you look for that in colleagues, like, oh, yes, that's an important life skill. And I, I have to, I have to laugh. You talking about teaching flexible thinking. I'm like, oh my gosh, do I have to do that? <laughs> um, yes. Even I think I've talked about this on our in an episode before at the dinner table. A lot of times we, you know, we'll ask each other like what was fun today or what was hard today or what was funny. And we just, my daughter gets really upset if I try to at, make her go first. Like, I'm like, oh, uh -huh. so how was, no, no, no. Dad goes first and then it's you. And then it's, and like, this is the order you're doing it wrong. And even there's a couple places in the town we live in that she's convinced they're a different name than they are. And so we drive past and she goes, that's that place. And I'm like, okay, I finally landed on, okay, I disagree. Like we disagree on this <laughs> because it is, there's no talking around it. And I'm like, someday you'll learn to read. <laughs> um, but yes, that skill, uh, I have to teach flexible thinking. Yes. And you um, know, that's a great example there of what you could do is, is I think of the birthday candles, one, two, three, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, I would get them from my table and I would rotate them with our seats of, you know, okay, today you're number one and daddy's number two and mom is number three. So you're first. And then the next day it's daddy's first, mommy's second, you're third. And it just rotates so that she gets, um, she gets used to that sometimes she is first. Um, we can also teach her words to say, I like to listen or watch first. May I, may I please listen and watch first? So we can also teach her to tactfully ask for the time that she needs. Um, and, and so it's that combination of both teaching her how to ask for what she needs respectfully and appropriately, but then also sometimes you got to go first. And so we'll practice it a little bit. And this is a very non-threatening situation to practice it. Yes. And uh, that is one thing that I know you have, you really have in the resources that you have available talking about how to teach our kids about their own temperament so they can advocate. And that's one thing when we did our kind of dive through these different temperament traits this season we haven't really gotten to cover too in depth yet and so I just want to tell our listeners we are going to talk about this strategy more um, on our Facebook live at the end of the season because I do I think this is I think that's such an incredible and empowering skill to hear a four-year-old you know that's how old my child is right now say I need some time to warm up or, you know, I need this, I'm not quite ready or in saying those things and, and they can. And I even think, you know, teenagers Absolutely. that have that emotional intelligence to say those things who are spirited or heck, I even think of myself as a, <laughs> probably a spirited, if I'm honest, adult. When I have a strong, intense reaction, I have to say things to people like, I need some time to process this instead of, I think this is stupid. Right. right. <laughs> um, so, yes, I love that idea of the tact. We can teach our spirited, intense kids some of that tactfulness on how it's appropriate to express what they need and want. Yes. And many spirited children also have a strong sense of justice and fairness. They don't like things that seem unfair. Um, and so for those kids, we have to teach them phrases like, that doesn't seem fair, or I don't like that rule, or um, I, I have a different idea, or may I have a choice. So again, you know, we, we, they are assertive, <laughs> and they are going to be leaders, and they are going to question authority, which is actually a good thing. Um, but we also can teach them to do that respectfully and appropriately. Yes. Oh, I can, like, that's not fair 
like rings around the halls of our home. <laughs> That's not fair. That's not fair. All the time. So you say that sense of justice. Oh, I, I, I see that play out in my family. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh, excellent. Well, I do have another parenting conundrum I want to ask you about. Okay. So, you know, we talk, we've talked about, we've had an episode on parenting styles and those things, you know, we talk about trying to balance appropriate expectations and warmth. Um, but sometimes when the idea with spirited kids, you know, that they are intense, that they are more, sometimes parents feel, um, the word I'm thinking of is like, that they need to dominate, right? They need to show an intense child or persistent child who's in charge. And so, uh, you know, as we think about raising our spirited kids, this idea of dominance to show their child who's in charge, you know, I'm, I'm curious just to hear your perspective on if you think that's helpful, if there are certain aspects of it that are on or off um, and how you think that plays out with spirited kids. So there's a difference between intimidation and um, authoritative. And so spirited kids, one, they'll match your intensity level. So if a spirited child's already intense and I yell at them or I grab them, it's like I just threw gasoline on a, on a fire. Um, I've now fueled the intensity and we don't want to go there. That's it, it's just then, you know, the child ends up hitting you or kicking you because now they're in complete fight or flight. So but that, again, doesn't mean we just ignore it because ignoring absolutely does not work <laughs> with these children. And so how we approach them is I'm somebody coming to help is I will help you. What do you need? And that we stay calm. Um, but at the same time, it's like, if you can't stop yourself, I will help you stop. You know, I'm not going to let you break that. I'm not going to let you kick me or hurt your brother. Um, and I will stop you. Um, it is cleanup time. And if you're not ready to clean up now, then you can take a break and we'll save this pile for you. But you're not going outside. You're not turning on electronics until that pile is picked up. And I will help you if you need some help. But we work together in our family. So there, spirited children need those clear limits, but they need a calm parent um, following through with those, those clear limits. Oh, I love that distinction of, yes, it's not, you know, sometimes people say, well, that kid, you know, we know who runs the show in that house, you know, and that's not what we're saying to let your spirited child walk all over you. Um, yeah, that the clear expectations. And I think, but the calm adult who can help with those clear expectations, uh, we, one of our kind of flagship, <laughs> flagship parenting strategies, we call it stop, breathe, talk. And we talk about yeah. the value of recognizing our own emotions. You know, we stop the interaction, no matter how far we are into it. We take that deep breath that helps re-regulate our system and our brain. And we think about what we want from the interaction. And, you know, what we really want is to teach our child to, you know, we all work together to help clean up or to teach our child it's important to keep our bodies clean. And that's why we take baths or, you know, what's the real goal? But we have to be regulated to do that. And so you're talking about being a calm parent. Um, you know, I just, I guess I just want to remind everybody that stop, breathe, talk, that deep breath in the heat of that moment, especially like I am also an intense person. And I have an intense child, uh, more than one intense child. Um, and so I do, I have to take that moment to re-regulate or it does that gasoline on a fire is exactly what it is. And that is one of the challenges because there's a genetic link to being spirited. So what triggers your child will also trigger you. Um, and, and again, what, uh, another thing I work with with parents is protecting their sleep. And when we do a daily schedule, um, the first thing I do is one, I encourage them to wake 30 minutes before the kids so they can dress in peace. They can do some meditation, they can exercise, they can savor a cup of coffee. 
it doesn't matter what as long as it brings them to a point of calm energy because starting the day with a child jumping on you or screaming in your ear you start the day in the red zone you're already intense energy um and then the other we do is after kids go to bed if you're co-parenting it's couple time that's the first thing you do when the kids are in bed so you take care of those adult relationships and if you're a single parent you take time to connect with other adults um and then the last is their bedtime and talking about you know we make choices tv facebook uh twitter <laughs> um uh you know or or sleep and please choose sleep oh i could not I needed someone to say that to me. <laughs> I have been, I, yes, I have an irregular temperament and it is so easy for me to stay up and I get that second wind and it comes hard and I'm ready to get stuff done and I do get stuff done and I'm exhausted the next day. Yeah. Um, and so, so you say, and I'm like, Ooh, okay. I maybe felt like I scored some points with those routine done <laughs> cards. I'm not scoring <laughs> points in the getting my own sleep routine down. I got to work on that one. <laughs> So what I have parents do is set an alarm on their phone. So mm. 30 minutes before you want um, your head and the pillow or your head needs, because adults need eight and a quarter hours of sleep. So if you wake at six in the morning, your head needs to be on the pillow at 945. So I actually have parents set an alarm on their phone for 915. And that's stop what you're doing, get ready for bed, go to bed. Um, and initially, you know, they laugh at me. They're like, that's never going to happen. And I'm like, try it because it becomes self-reinforcing. You aren't exhausted. You actually still get all that stuff done because you're more energetic, but it's not at the expense of your sleep and your well-being because there's, there's huge health costs to not getting adequate sleep. Oh, absolutely. Okay. I'm going to have to try that and I'm going to have to report back. <laughs> well, I even think that's kind of like sneaky teaching yourself for four warnings, which we talk about giving our kids who are less adaptable, like, okay, you have 10 minutes. Okay. You have two minutes. Like, okay. I have 30 minutes before I have to go upstairs. <laughs> right. Oh, that's so great. Oh, well, Mary, thank you so much. I, I guess I do want to give you one more chance. Is there anything else we didn't cover that you want to make sure that parents of spirited kids get the chance to hear? I think two things. One is there's information to make it better. You're not alone. Um, you don't, you know, you contribute genes <laughs> uh, if you're, if this is a biological child. But the bottom line is your child came wired to be spirited. This is an asset. These are traits that we value in adults. And whether it's my books, Raising Your Spirited Child, Raising Your Spirited Baby, the books of others, there are other wonderful temperament authors um, that there is information that will make it better. And you, you truly, there's those who've gone before you um, you don't have to travel this path alone. Oh, well, thank you so much, Mary, for joining us on this podcast episode. It is so great to have you and to hear, you know, you're very specific. You know, you have great experience in this specific expertise in this temperament. And so to hear all of your strategies and insights and honestly, just your encouragement that you've lived <laughs> the spirited child life and that you value spirited people. I think it's just so good to hear from you. So thank you again for coming on our podcast here. Thank you. And if I can add one more, I thought of one more. Yes. Is, yes. Um, there is a Facebook spirited child group. It, it has tens of thousands of parents in it from all over the world. Um, it's active 24 seven. Um, and you can also go to my website and sign up for the weekly blogs and they'll come right into your email box, um, on just different strategies and working. Otherwise you can also find all of them on my website, parentchildhelp.com. Awesome. Which we will go ahead and drop that. We have a temperament, um, kind of landing page that we have on our science of parenting website. So we'll make sure we drop that in there so parents can find those resources. Great. 
Thank you. This has been so fun. Oh, thank you. Well, I just want to say thanks again for coming on the Science of Parenting and talking about the research and reality around the spirited temperament. Thank you. The Science of Parenting is a research-based education program hosted by Lori Haynes and Mackenzie Johnson, produced by Mackenzie DeYoung with research and writing by Barbara Dunn Swanson. Send in questions and comments to parenting at I-A-S-T-A-T-E dot E-D-U and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. This program is brought to you by Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. This institution is an equal opportunity provider. For the full non-discrimination statement or accommodation inquiries, go to www.extension.iastate.edu slash diversity slash ext.